We're going to explore biblical archaeology. We call it digging up the truth. We'll talk about the stones that pry out. You know, archaeology is intrinsically fascinating. It often fills in details about the life of ancient times, but just finding a tangible object tends to transform something that is abstract and ancient into something that's tangible in our very hands. It could be a shard of pottery, it could be whatever, but it's, it has its intrinsic fascinations, and we'll talk about that. We'll also, before we're through, talk about its dangers. About its dangers. Now, usually when we think of archaeology, we think of the ancient ruins, and there are many wonderful ruins. There are more ru ruins of ancient Rome and Algeria than there are in Italy. But uh, this is a picture of Ephesus, of the, of, the church, of the ancient churches. It's amazing. If you get a chance, Ephesus is just an exemplar of discoveries. One of the things we're going to touch upon in this very superficial survey this evening are the technologies that associated with archaeology. Actually, up until recent times, it really was a spade and shovel kind of technology. People would dig, they'd find something, they'd mark its location, and by various methods try to date it. It was a, a very, very primitive technology up until maybe the 80s. What they did do along the way, they started developing systematic methods where they find, they, when they t discover a find, they'd lay out a grid, and they'd mark very carefully what they find, where they find. There's also a huge technology behind pottery. With a piece of pottery, they can learn a great deal today because of just the, the history of finds of pottery. And so, relax, we're not going to get into that tonight. But we are going to talk about the advanced technologies. You know, uh, Chuck Smith and I had the privilege of participating with uh, Lambert Dolphin, introducing into the archaeological community in Israel in uh, 1981 a number of advanced technologies, including ground-penetrating radar. It turns out it surprises many people to discover that the right kind of equipment on a small cart can actually penetrate the ground by maybe 10 meters or more. Not a big deal if the conditions are right, but it does tell you where to dig, what you might find. It's a very useful technique. There's also microgravity sensors, little sensors that can sense the difference in gravity, which reveals the possibility of a subterranean structure in places like the Temple Mountain elsewhere. And one of the most illuminating technologies is infrared scanning or thermographic recording. We'll show you a few examples and some suggestive evidences and some surprises before the evening's over. We'll also explore another technology. Just a few years ago, they've developed a scanning laser microscope that can actually discern between 20 different layers a millionth of a meter apart. They can tell the layers of ink, they can even tell the angle of the stylus on a papyrus when it was written. It's amazing what some of this technology, and of course, there's even discussions at least that DNA is going to have a play in a technology in some spooky ways. But one of the things that you've all seen, I'm sure, is pictures of cuneiform tablets. And in the 19th century, tens of thousands of these tablets were found in many sites all through Mesopotamia. And relax, we're not going to catalog those tonight and we'll drag you through all of those, but recognize that libraries of tens of thousands of tablets were found with all kinds of things. What was needed, though, was a way to decipher them because they represent a language of a culture that's no longer around, and that is an incredible challenge. That's a field called paracryptology, trying to unravel the uh, language of a lost culture. Now, one of the great discoveries, there's a number of discoveries that are really worth examining because they have such incredible leverage and impact on our whole life. One is Behistun Mountain in Iran. It actually is a, a mountain that's about 1,700 feet high, but 400 feet above the valley floor, there's an inscription, quite an elaborate description, and I won't get, go through all of that, but it was done by Darius I in 516 B.C., celebrating some of his exploits. But the important thing is that Sir Henry Rawlinson in 1835 took the trouble, many years in fact, to take advantage of the inscriptions that just below the carvings, about uh, uh, the carvings are about 400 feet above the, uh, the valley floor, they had, there's about a one foot ledge there, and he put up ladders and spent several years making impressions. And uh, what's exciting about the inscriptions, they're written in three languages, in Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian cuneiform. And because it's written in multiple languages, it gives you something to work with to start un uh, unscrambling those. And of course, it's thanks to him in the Behistun Mountain discoveries, after many years, they were able to decipher cuneiform writing, and that began to open up 
to our knowledge, these tens of thousands of cuneiform tablets that have been accumulated and still are uh, from these ancient finds. There's a similar kind of find in 1799. One of Napoleon was in Egypt and one of his officers found the Rosetta Stone. Rosetta is simply being the town near which they found it, which is on the west edge of the uh, delta, the Nile Delta in Egypt. And this is quite a rock. It is about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide, and about a foot thick. You can actually, we just got back from a visit to the British Museum, my wife and I, a few weeks ago, and had a chance to refresh her. So we'd seen it before, but it was interesting because we knew we were going to be doing this presentation to, to actually examine the famous Rosetta Stone. Again, one of the reasons it became so valuable is that it's written in three languages. It was written in a hieroglyphic, which has always fascinated people, some kind of mysterious priestly writing with many with much folklore behind it. There's a later, about 800 BC, there was a demotic, it's another, it's a sort of a shorthand version of hieroglyphic, and then Greek, and Greek, of course, was well known. Jacques Francois Champollion spent most of his life studying multiple languages. I think at the age of 16, he was fluent in eight of the ancient languages, in addition to Greek and Latin and the rest. He became a very great expert in Egyptology, and uh, he spent, there, there are many people that attacked the Rosetta Stone with rather fanciful notions. He was the one that discovered that the hieroglyphics were sometimes phonetic, sometimes structural, and sometimes pictures. In other words, but the big discovery was the realization that the, the language was in part phonetic, which was a surprise because they looked like pictures, but some of them were deliberately phonetic. There's about three signs that represent the sound mu for cat, and then there's a picture of a cat. So it takes about four signs to communicate a cat. But the point is, there's not a consistency in the, in the application. So it was a real challenge. It was uh, many, many years before it finally settled down. But the Rosetta Stone, thanks to Champion, is, is uh, now the key to the understanding hieroglyphics. Now, as we look through archaeology, some of the fascinating finds that you read about in any good handbook on archaeology are the records for what we sometimes call prehistory, from the first 11 chapters, the book of Genesis. There are all kinds of cuneiform records of the creation sagas, what's in the Ashurbanipal library, which had tens of thousands. They found actually seven tablets that chronicle the creation in terms that are surprisingly, not precisely, but closely parallel to the Genesis record. What's also interesting is they've even found in Mesopotamia flood records, the Gilgamesh epic being one of the famous ones. But you can actually find 33 versions of Noah's flood in various forms. Only two of them have, don't really con coincide with the biblical record. So it's interesting. These are just legends, and they're, but they're, it's provocative to see that they, did, they seem to echo an original common story. One of the interesting ones is a list of the Sumerian kings. This find lists kings who reigned for extended periods of time. Then a great flood came. And the lists of the kings after the flood have shorter reigns than the ones before. Now, there's lots of scholastic debate about exactly how long those periods of time are, but the provocative thing is the ones before the flood lived very, very long, long times, and the ones after the flood shorter. So that is, of course, the pattern that we find in, Genesis, in the Genesis record. We could go through all kinds of archaeological finds that seem to confirm our understanding from the scripture. There's a campaign to, into uh, Israel by Pharaoh Shishak in 1 Kings 14. We find that same campaign recorded on the walls of the Temple of Amun in Thebes, Egypt. The revolt of Moab against Israel recorded in 1 Kings 1. We find recorded on the Mesha inscription, a famous inscription. The fall of Samaria to uh, Sargon II, king of Assyria, is recorded on his palace walls, just as it is recorded in uh, 2 Kings 1 and 18. The defeat of Ashdod by Sargon II is recorded on his palace walls in Isaiah 20. The campaign of the Assyrian king Sennacherib against Judah uh, is recorded in the Taylor Prism. And uh, the siege of Lachish uh, by Sennacherib uh, recorded in the Lachish Reliefs, uh, recorded in 2 Kings 18 again. The assassination of Sennacherib by his own sons is recorded in the annals of his own son, Esharden, also recorded in 1 Kings 19. The fall of the walls of Jericho, very controversial even among archaeologists, but as recently as March 5th of 1990, Time magazine, hardly a biblical authority, also admitted, in fact, the title of the article was Score One for the Bible, 
because much, they now believe much of what the Bible says can be confirmed by some of the records. And, and the fall of Nineveh was predicted by the prophets, both Nahum and uh, Zephaniah, is recorded on the tablet of Nabopolassar, which they found. And it's as recorded in Zephaniah 2 and also in the book of Nahum. The fall of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to talk a little about this, uh, about the, uh, the fall of Babylon shortly. But the fall of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is recorded in the Babylonian Chronicles, a very famous find from 2 Kings 24. The captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in Babylon, recorded in the Babylonian ration records. Here we have in 2 Kings 24, that's recorded, but they actually find the ration records, and he, there's an allusion to him in those, interestingly enough. Not big deals, but the more they find, we find these sort of checkpoints where the re biblical record can be echoed, if you will, in the records in stone. The fall of Babylon to the Medes and the Persians, recorded in the Cyrus Zoner. We're going to talk about that in Daniel chapter 5. The identity of Belshazzar as the son of Nabonidus, it was a big controversy uh, among historians. I can remember reading books, even as a teenager, that, uh, of skeptics pointing out that the Bible is really uh, fanciful because there, this guy Belshazzar, who apparently was the king of Babylon, Daniel 5, when the Persians conquered Babylon, never existed. There's no record of him. Well, wrong guys, on, on a cornerstone in the temple of Ur, they found his identity alluded to there. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The freeing of the captives in Babylon by Cyrus the Great is recorded on the Cyrus Cylinder. And it's also that, uh, as our one. Cyrus is an interesting guy. We'll pause here and look a little more in depth. Cyrus was part Mede and part Persian. His father was Persian, Cambyses I, and Cyrus's mother, Mandane, was a daughter of Astyagus, the king of Media. So he is actually half of both. And he's the one that rallies the Persians and the Medes together. And the first thing he did after he did that into, a, into an empire, he attacked his father-in-law, who was a very corrupt king, and he captured Ecbatana without a battle. That's going to be his pattern. By a show of strength and clever strategies, he conquers places without actually having to fight. He circles them and just takes over. And he did that with the capital. It becomes the capital end of the Persian Empire. He welded the Medes and the Persians into a unified nation that continued for 200 years. That's why they call him Cyrus the Great. But it was his general that conquered the unconquerable. Babylon was recognized in that era as being absolutely impregnable. About 15 miles on the side, double towers, 250 of them. The, tower, the, the wall around was wide enough to have chariot races uh, four abreast. Uh, this, was a, this was a formidable place. It was fed by the river Euphrates, which not only fed the moat, but also gave him a water supply in case of siege. Well, October 12th of 539 B.C., Cyrus's general captured Babylon without a battle. That turns out to be very important. Many of your Bible dictionaries things do not highlight this for you. It's important for you to understand for a number of reasons, because a lot of misconceptions surround this strange place called Babylon. We know from Herodotus that the Persians had diverted the river, Euphrates, into a canal, and uh, that caused the water level in the moat around Babylon to drop to the height of the middle of a man's thigh, according to Herodotus, which thus rendered the flood defenses useless and enabled the invaders to slip under the gates and enter the, the city by night. Now, while all this was going on, when the Persians were attacking, Belshazzar, in his arrogance, instead of defending, threw a party for a thousand of his guys. And he did it in a room that has been reconstructed today. You could, you, that very room has, has been rebuilt for Saddam Hussein. But he throws this party. And in Daniel 5, you have this very colorful scene where they're throwing this party, and he also decides to go across the street to the north. There's a m museum where his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had stored the temple vessels that were taken 70 years earlier. He took the temple vessels in to use in the party. Well, that didn't please God too much. And so they all get shook up because on the, suddenly they see a man's hand writing on the wall. And that's a famous event. You can read about it in Daniel 5. But the point is that Belshazzar gets shook. And what's going on from other records is that meanwhile, while that's all happening, the Persians had taken over the city. We have records that indicate that the residents in Babylon didn't even know it for three days. They just took over. They slipped under and took around. There, wasn't, there was not a battle. That's a very key point, by the way. But it's about, it's a few days later that Cyrus makes his grand entrance. His general, of course, conquered the city, but he makes his grand entrance. And when he enters, and according to Josephus in Antiquities, when Cyrus made his entrance, Daniel is the guy that presents him with an ancient scroll of Isaiah which contained a personal letter addressing Cyrus by his personal name. And uh, Isaiah had died 150 years earlier, by the way. So this, this is, this, you know, here's the letter that Daniel shows Cyrus. 
Thus, speaking of God, thus saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. And that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to thy temple thy foundation shall be laid. Jerusalem and the temple were about 200 miles to the west in rubble. But God is predicting this, Cyrus, you're going, and calls you by name, you're going to let my people go back and do all this. And thus saith the Lord to his anointed, strange term in the Old Testament of a Gentile king, it says uh, the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I'm going to spare this audience the detail of some of this, but you will find an absolute chuckle if you want to take our uh, Daniel commentary and unravel what we do, what do we mean by all this, but let's move on. The letter to Cyrus, I will go before thee, God says, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut and sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Can you imagine being Cyrus reading this letter that was in this ancient scroll that was written long before you were born, calling you by name and outlining, highlighting your career here? I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Well, history records that Cyrus was impressed. <laughs> and he not only frees the captives that he's just taken over, the, the Hebrews that are among the Babylonians that he's conquered, he even gives them financial incentives to go home and build a temple. He was impressed, and he uh, freed the captives, gave them incentives. And uh, thus, and according to Ezra, thus saith Cyrus, the king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, Judah, and build the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Well, if you go to the British Museum today, and I visited many times, but was never available for some reason because they're doing some reconstruction in the various wings, but it is there, it was there two weeks ago, there is the Cyrus Cylinder. It's about 14 inches long, and I don't know, I guess it may be 8, 9 inches in diameter at its widest point, and it's there, you can see it, the actual cylinder. I was hoping that somebody, that sometimes they sell replicas of things there, they didn't have one of this, I'd love to get my hands on one just for, uh, for the sake of it. But on this, among other things, it says, that he conquered it, conquered Babylon without any battle. He entered the town sparing any calamity. I returned the sacred cities on the other side of the Tigris, the sanctuaries of which have been ruins for a long time and established for them permanent sanctuaries. I also gathered all their former inhabitants and returned them to their habitations, and so on. It goes on. Now this is important because there are many of your Bible helps say that Babylon was destroyed in 539 B.C. Wrong. Don't confuse the fall of Babylon to the Persians at that date, with the destruction of Babylon. Because the problem is, see, what happened was Cyrus made it a secondary capital for 200 years. Alexander the Great comes along and then conquers the Persians. And Alexander makes Babylon his capital. He dies there. After Alexander dies, the four generals divide up the empire. They also build another city which drew the, uh, the uh, trade routes. So Babylon starts to atrophy. As late as 75 AD, the merchants there were still trying to make a go of it. As late as the 1800s, a German architect by the name of Koldewey was uh, excavating Babylon, and he would be able to hire local residents. Now why is that so important? Because Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 both describe, prophetically, the destruction of Babylon. And the problem is, it's never happened, not the way they describe. They describe it's going to be, it's going to be dis, uh, destroyed very suddenly. They describe it as a city on the banks of the Euphrates. They describe it as the pride of the Chaldeans' excellency. It's going to be destroyed just like Sodom and Gomorrah. They both make that remark, both Isaiah and Jeremiah. Once it's destroyed, it'll never again be inhabited. Once it's destroyed, they won't ever even use the, reuse the building materials. And it goes on with lots of detail. Now, why is this so important? Well, first of all, no matter how you try, this doesn't fit history. So many people figure, well, it's just, it's, all, it's just symbolic. When you get to the book of Revelation, it talks about mystery Babylon. Many good scholars, and I'll put Dave Hunt's uh, 
work right at the head of the list. Dave Hunt wrote a book called A Woman Rides the Beast, in which he identifies Mystery Babylon as a so closely associated with the Vatican and the Church of Rome. That's not a new idea. That, that was, uh, that's been around for centuries. The classic work was done by Alexander Hislop, called the Two Babylons, meaning the literal Babylon of the past and the Babylon of Revelation, tying it to the Catholic Church. Well, Dave Hunt picks up on that, modernizes it, thoroughly documented. If you're of a Catholic background, it's essential you read Dave Hunt's book, Woman Rides the Beast. It may offend you, but uh, you'll discover it's very well uh, documented. And so while Dave is correct, he also, though, dismisses literal Babylon as relevant. I hold the view, as some do, that both are true. That literal Babylon on the banks of Euphrates is going to be rebuilt and destroyed as Isaiah and Jeremiah both describe. So uh, that's a big issue, but what's interesting, the Cylinder of Cyrus is a key peg in that whole scenario. Understand what the future of Babylon is. Now Saddam Hussein has started rebuilding it. It's modest at the moment. But from our understanding of prophecy, we believe it's ultimately going to be very, very relevant. Well, let's shift to discoveries focusing on the New Testament. This is one of my favorite sites, if for no other reason there's no controversy about it. You can talk about all kinds of other New Testament sites, and they're a matter of opinion or tradition. The Sea of Galilee, uh, I don't know of anyone that argues that it's, that ain't the Sea of Galilee, because it is the Sea of Galilee. And uh, the Sea of Galilee, a few years ago, reached a, its lowest ebb in, in, uh, in a century. And in the mud, they found a boat. Uh, before I get into that, the existence of Jesus, by the way, people say there's no historical record of Jesus. That's nonsense. It's recorded by Josephus, Suetonius, Thallus, Pliny the Younger, the Talmud itself, and Lucian. I can remember Walter Martin was uh, on a radio program with a Jewish skeptic, and he said that there's no record of Jesus. And, and Walter said, well, what about your Talmud? Is that reliable? The guy looked shocked. So the Talmud re records that Jesus Christ was the illegitimate son of Mary. So there's a record of his historicity, and the guy didn't have any answer because, you know, Anyway, also the fact that for, the Jews were forced to leave Rome during the reign of Claudius has been recorded, uh, Suetonius and so forth. But the interesting thing I started to get into is this fishing boat. In 1986, a Roman-era fishing boat was discovered in the Sea of Galilee near Kibbutz Nofganassar. Kibbutz Nofganassar is right near Tiberias, just a little to the north. Uh, the, the, the Sea of Galilee that year was at its lowest it had been in, in many, many decades, probably a century. And so in the mud, some people noticed that there seemed to be some timbers. The good news was there's some young people that were very quick to realize what this might mean, and they quickly called some of the experts from the university. They flew in experts from all over the world to examine this. The strange chemistry of the mud has preserved this thing. It's 26, 26 feet long, 7 feet wide. It's made of Lebanese cedar and oak. It since has been, has been radiocarbon dated to about 15 B.C. plus or minus 85. Now, we're not talking deep, deep ancient thing. You know, this is a couple thousand years. Radiocarbon can be relatively reliable. It's when you get deeper uh, uh, dating that it becomes rather uh, uh, problematic. But uh, So what they did from 1986 to 1995, they had a specially built tank made. They carefully removed this and uh, kept, kept it in the water so it wouldn't just fall apart. And they developed a chemical process by which the, the waterlogged wood would have, the water would be replaced by wax. And it took virtually a decade for that to take place. So if you visited Galilee from 1980, we were there in 86, 7. We go there every year, typically. But over those years, you could visit, they're building a special museum, but they're just this big tank. You could, couldn't see very clearly what was in it. But in 1995, it was put on display at the Yigal Alon Museum, which is right there at North Guinnessar, which happens to be the kibbutz right there. And this is what, really what you see. It's, a 20, as I say, 26 feet long, 7 feet wide. It, some people call it the Jesus boat. That's a little fanciful. But it is, apparently, a boat that was used for fishing. And by, and by the way, the construction techniques have been much studied. We've learned a great deal from it of that period, the Roman period. It was the type of boat that apparently did populate the sea. It was the kind of boat that we do find alluded to in the, uh, in the scriptures. And obviously no one knows whether this particular boat was written by any particular person, but it is a very, very fascinating. And if, you're in, if you go to uh, Nofganassar or Tiberias, it's one of those things you will um, want to see. North of the lake we find uh, Capernaum, which is much talked about, been much excavated uh, and confirmed. The synagogue that the centurion built that we find uh, referred to in the book of Luke is there, reconstructed in part. 
Along the coast, there, uh, there is Caesarea. You, one of the things you, want to do, you do want to visit Caesarea, Re realize the Roman capital in, of Judea was not in Jerusalem, it was on the coast. They, made a, they had a, a whole uh, artificial harbor there. They were in Jerusalem in the Gospel period because at the, at the holidays. But the Roman capital and its prisons and the head of the garrisons, all that, was down in Caesarea. On, right uh, just north of Caesarea, there is an aqueduct that uh, brought fresh water to that city. Interestingly enough, you can find, when you go there, you'll find a plaque that uh, commends the, uh, the performance of the Roman 12th Legion, which built the aqueduct, and you can read that yourself there. Another thing that you can read in Caesarea is a tablet that alludes to Pontius Pilate, Pilatus. Now, the one that's there is now a replica. The original is in the museum. It was used, it, had been re it was originally something else. They used it in the rebuilding of the... Uh, the huge amphitheater there is one of the seats, and someone noticed that it was, it, uh, was uh, very, very valuable, obviously. Well, we could go on and on with these little uh, discoveries. The discoveries that are prob probably the most profound are the ones that are high leverage. We talked about the Histone Mountain, which opened up the cuneiform writing. We talked about the Rosetta Stone, which opened up hieroglyphics, if you will. The Dead Sea Scrolls clearly are the front page news, uh, so to speak, in archaeology. In 1947, they discovered uh, these things. Now, near the south end of the Dead Sea, there's an oasis, and right near that oasis, there's a city called Qumran, and up in the hills from Qumran, there are 11 caves. And in those caves, they found, hidden away, in jars and so forth, all kinds of scrolls. What's exciting about it, in Qumran, they found over 1,100 documents and over a hundred thousand fragments. And uh, this is unquestionably one of the most exciting discoveries. It, w w from originally in 1947, but there's been a lot subsequent because there's, as the years go by, they find other things too. But the point is the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran site, people spend their lifetime studying the results of what was found in these areas. There are over 200 copies of the books of the Bible. And they every book is, rep not, not, not complete, they're just parts of them, but every book of the Bible, except the book of Esther, has been, they've been found parts of it. But the, one of the most exciting aspects of this is they found a complete scroll of the book of Isaiah. And what is astonishing about the scroll they found is that it has virtually no difference from the Isaiah we have today. Many people say, gee, you know, it's gone through recopying, recopying, and so forth. It must be different. Here's an ancient, this is, this is a copy from uh, a, 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 the mid-7th century. Uh, in, the, in the 60s A.D. Uh, or earlier. The, er, the copy itself may be much, much earlier, but the point is the libraries were secreted there just before the fall of Jerusalem. Here is a copy of Isaiah that is about a thousand years older than any that we've had up till then. And what's astonishing is the, the lack of differences. I think there's something like nine letters that are slightly different that are, not, that are trivial. Nothing doctrinal different, not doctrinally different. And if you go to Israel today, in Jerusalem, there's the Israeli Museum, Adjacent to it and part of it is called the Shrine of the Book. The shape of the roof is intended to, to represent the top of the lid of the jars that they're found. And you in that uh, museum, it's especially uh, for the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you can examine the entire length of the Book of Isaiah. Let's talk about another papyri. It's not a Dead Sea find, but it's a convenient time to talk about the Magdalen papyri. And this is recent stuff. The three little scraps were unearthed in Upper Egypt by Charles B. Hewlett, and he was an Egyptologist, and uh, he bequeathed these little this, these scraps to his alma mater, which was Magdalen College in Oxford. He, he bequeathed them to his college in 1901. That's why they call it the Magdalen Papyri, because they were there, and people knew they were there, and they've been studied. In 1953, you're talking about 50 years later, British a pyrologist, uh, Colin H. Roberts, studied it, and he related it to be a se late second century papyrus. He, he, he felt uh, his guess was that these things were probably written in the late second century. It would be 40 years later that advanced technology would re-examine these things and reveal that they, are they were contemporaneous with the apostle himself, the apostle of Matthew. Here are pictures, front and back, of the papyri. The Magdalen Greek, it's uh, called 17P64, is the technical designation. It's a segment of green text of Matthew's Gospel. The Greek text seems to have been dated before 66 AD. 
There are three fragments, text on both sides. Now that's unusual for papyrus. Papyrus is smooth on one side, rough on the other. The fact that it's written on both sides implies that it's a codex. A codex is what we have as a book. If you hold up a book, it's got a, pages. That's called a codex. The original ancient scrolls were scrolls. They take papyrus right on one side, sew them together. We had a whole bunch of them, say maybe 20 feet. What well, they'd roll it up, and that'd be a, that would be what they call a book. We would call it a scroll. But it was about the gospel time, of the gospel period, that notebooks or codexes were beginning to show up. Paul asked Timothy in his second letter to bring his notebooks. By the way, so uh, they were starting to they were starting to use codexes a lot handier. And once you put the papyri or vellum, vellum is really what most of them were, you would try. To, you, you would obviously write, try to write on both sides. And the fact that this is written on both sides implies this was a codex, which is interesting. There's about 24 lines. It's an excerpt of Matthew 26, verses 23 and 31. Now, those of you that have been studying translation stuff, it's interesting. The Greek here can, corresponds with Textus Receptus, not the Westcott and the Hort. I don't want to get off on another thing, but I mentioned that in passing for those of you who know about those controversies. In 1994. Advanced technology comes to the rescue. A scanning laser microscope can differentiate between 20 micrometers, that's a millionth of a meter, layers of papyrus. It can measure the height and depth of the ink and it, as well as the angle of the stylus that, while it was writing. Using these advanced technologies, Dr. Carson Peter Thede, who was director of the Institute of Basic Epistemological Research at Paderborn, Germany, using a scanning laser microscope, compared the, the Magdalene papyri with four other known manuscripts, one at Qumran dated 5880, one, well, anyway, uh, at Masada, an Egyptian town, and so forth. There's, a, there's a four other manuscripts that he compared it to, and here's the, here's the expert conclusion. Dr. Thiede concluded that this is either an original of Matthew's Gospel or an immediate copy written while Matthew and the other disciples and other eyewitnesses were still alive. This is actually the discovery of the Magdalene papyrus' dating has totally overturned some of the skeptical views about the aging of the New Testament. The Old Testament was put together over thousands of years, but the New Testament was written within one lifetime. And there's a big difference. And what's interesting here, this was dated not on the basis of some literary theory or historical suppositions, but rather on the physical evidence, with using, actually using the physics of it. So that's very, very exciting. We learn a lot of things, by the way, about Matthew. One of the things we know is he took shorthand. Remember, they had a culture that had no copiers, no printers. Everything was handwritten. And so obviously it doesn't take a lot of imagination, especially in commercial transactions. They developed techniques of shorthand writing. If you look at Psalm 45, verse 1, where in the Septuagint, where it was translated into the Greek three centuries before Christ, in the English Bible, say so and so was a ready writer. The term in the Greek is actually a technical term for a stenographer, shorthand writer. That means that technical term was in common use in Greek when that translation, the Septuagint, was done, which is about the third century before Christ was born. Matthew was a customs official. It was a requirement for his job to be able to record in shorthand. If you study Matthew's Gospel, it seems to be the longest of, it's longer than Mark. Mark seems shorter than Matthew. Uh-uh. Matthew is shorter than Mark if you exclude the discourses. What makes Matthew so different is the discourses are extensive. We now believe that he was able to copy down what Christ said verbatim. That was one of his skills. So there's a whole thing about that. And we go, we go into all this in a briefing package called How We Got Our Bible, for those that you really want to get into this stuff. But we've talked about high leverage discoveries, the Eastern Mountain, Rosetta Stone, and Dead Sea Scrolls to get for the survey. Let's take a look at some of the geographic myths that have been unseated. We are always victims of self-imposed traditions. They used to always believe that Christ was crucified at the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. If you investigate its history, you discover it was selected by a mystic with no biblical evidence. In contrast to that, there we've discovered the garden tomb. And even though when you go to Israel, they won't present it as the authentic tomb, they'll just say it one probably very like it. Truth of the matter is, the more you know about the text, and the more you know about the details of the garden tomb, the more, let's put it this way, I believe it really was the tomb that Christ was in. Having studied it some, it doesn't mean I'm right, but at least there's a basis. Mount Sinai. Everybody's gone to the Sinai Peninsula and gone to Jabal Musa, which is presumably Mount Sinai, except there's some problems with it. There's absolutely no evidence for it. 
And the shocking thing was that over 100 years of searching, they found absolutely no evidence of several million people having camped there for 40 years. And there were some recent discoveries that we'll, we discussed separately is that we now believe that Jabal al-Laws in Saudi Arabia is the, the site. I'll come back to that in a minute. St. Paul's in Bay in Malta is the traditional site of the shipwreck of Paul described in Acts 27. But if you take the Bible and see what it really says, you can come to the conclusion it was on the southern shore, not the northern shore. And Mount Ararat, there's a Mount Ararat in Turkey, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The Garden Tomb, if you go to the Garden Tomb, it's a beautiful place to visit. The high point in almost everybody that visits a Bible tour in Israel for a couple of weeks, their high point is communion at the Garden Tomb. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful experience. The empty tomb, we do find tombs that have that style, a rolling stone as the scripture describes. This is a different one, but shows the practice. This is a picture of the garden tomb taken 1900 years ago in the moonlight. And once you know how to use Photoshop, you'll never trust a picture again. <laughs> but recent find, other recent finds, by the way, the house of David and king of Israel was found on inscriptions just a few years ago in the Galan Heights at Tel Dan. In 1996, a wine jug inscribed with King Herod's name was found at Masada. Every, not a day goes by. See, the frustrating thing with a, a, a briefing like this is that by the time you get home tonight, it will be out of date because there are things being found every day. And, and, and just last year, they found the confirmation that James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. The Vatican's tried to hush that up, but a couple of the excavators are Messianic Jews. The story leaked out. There are some major challenges. One is the temple temple to be rebuilt. We know the temple's going to be rebuilt because Ma Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, 15. Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And John talks about it in Revelation chapter 11, first two verses. So we don't know when it's going to be built. It has no connection to the rapture or anything like that, despite some people's presumptions. It's going to be built. Some, all we know is that we'll be standing at the second coming. In fact, in the middle of that, three and a half years before the second coming. And these are just model reconstructions from the, from the second temple. If you go from the northwest and look southeast, this is what, an aerial view. You have the, the Dome of the Rock, which gives Israel, or I say Jerusalem, its characteristic skyline. And just to the south of that, you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And over here, just to the uh, west of the, of the temple floor, there is a wall, a retaining wall, and the, a drop in elevation, you have what's called the Western Wall. It used to be called the Wailing Wall, but that's out of date today. Most of you have all seen pictures of that the temple floor being up here and then there's a drop this is actually this wall is actually a retaining wall to to hold in the temple mount i'll show you a topographic picture of it in a minute all of us have seen the goings on in the western wall they have the men's side and the women's side They're separated by a wall they always have some bar, bar mitzvahs going on or other celebrations you go through this opening here you can also go through a tunnel it goes along that wall all the way to the arab quarter it's really quite breathtaking uh, 20 years ago, you could only do that by knowing somebody, a special arrangement. Today, it's been set up so it's a, it, you generally can make arrangements to get through there if you do it in advance. And uh, it's a wonderful time to do that. This is an aerial view which will be useful for our discussions. North is at the top. This rectangular 35 acres is the most precious piece of real estate on the planet Earth. There's the Dome of the Rock. There is the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And right between, on a line between them, is the Al-Qa'z fountain, the famous fountain that the Arabs washed before going into the mosque. Over here is the Wailing Wall. If you want to go up to the Temple Mount, you come around here to this ramp, and you go up this ramp through the Maghrabi Gate, and you're on the Temple Mount floor. That's roughly the, the topography. Now, the traditional view of the Temple, Second Temple, and then the First Temple, is that it stood where the Dome of the Rock stands today. That is the view of most people. That's what most books will tell you. That's what the official view of the rabbinate in Israel would tell you. That's, uh, that hasn't changed, except most people, scientists, uh, don't take it seriously. Dr. Asher Kaufman, for lots of reasons, did his research, and he has endorsed what's called the northern view or northern conjecture. Chuck Smith and I funded his research way, way back, uh, are acknowledged in his writings, strangely enough, but 20 years ago, he published uh, the, his view that the temple actually stood 100 meters to the north, and lining up with what was believed to be the Golden Gate. There is a gate in this Turkey, under, under, it's a Turkish gate, but underneath that there is a first century gate. Many people presume, even to this day, that it's the Golden Gate. And that's the northern conjecture. What, made, what created all the excitement is the Dome of the Rock would be standing, if he's right, in the outer court, which seems to fit Revelation chapter 11, 1 and 2. 
And that was a lot, that was very, very exciting to many Christians that, ooh, that's a, that might be the possibility. But there's some problems. When you start to try to create a three-dimensional model of the Temple Mount, you run into some problems. King Agrippa could watch the offerings being performed in the Azaram. And topographically, you can't work that out. The temple would be too high. The, the bedrock drops in altitude going south. It implies the temple had to be further to the south to get it low enough for this to happen. Also, the Romans could watch what was going on in the Azara. In fact, the Jews got Nero to allow them to put a partition up to prevent that. So if you try to deal with the three-dimensional aspects of that, you run into all kinds of problems. There's a water aqueduct that fed the high priest's mikvah. And if the temple stood at the Dome of the Rock, it'd be 21 meters too high in altitude. That aqueduct's still there. It can be surveyed. It really creates problems. And there's also a question of a location of a moat. I won't, the interest of getting on was the, the moat should be north of the Antonio Fortress, not south, and we know where the moat would be. So there are issues. So some background history. Jerusalem, of course, fell in 70 AD. We talked about that the other evening. Uh, the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions killed over a million men, women, children, and Jerusalem fell. About 50 years later, Bar Kokhba led a revolt. His uh, followers slaughtered the Roman 12th Legion, something they never recovered from. And for three years, they enjoyed a measure of success, but it took the Romans three years to get their act together and regain Jerusalem. And by then, Emperor Hadrian had concluded that you'll never rule that city as long as there's any Jewish presence. So they, they had already destroyed the temple. During the Bar Kokhba revolt, he tried to rebuild it. But they leveled the city and they plowed the entire city of Jerusalem under and they put up a city called Aila Capitolina on the ruins. You can find all that archaeologically there when you're injured, when you visit Jerusalem. But they also built a temple to Jupiter over the site of the original Jewish temple. They also put an equestrian statue of Hadrian right over the Holy of Holies. That's in Jerome's rec uh, commentary on Isaiah. Well, Architects notice that the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Qa'z Fountain and the Al-Aqsa Mosque are on a center line. To, a, to an architect, that implies a plan. The guy that uh, built the Jerusalem Temple in Jerusalem also built a Temple of Jupiter at Baalbek, Lebanon. And if you look at how Romans built their temples in that first century, they typically had a rectangular basilica opening to a large courtyard. Opposite of the basilica was a rotunda, a polygon of some kind. In Baalbek, Lebanon, it's a hexagon. And between these, you could put your various statues in this courtyard between the basilica and the rotunda. If you take the Baalbek Temple of Jupiter's plan exactly, go to Jerusalem, and to take your center line, and put it on there, it fits exactly. And it was built by the same guy, by Atanias Pius. And except in Jerusalem, it's an octagon, and in Lebanon, it's a hexagon, but other than that, it fits perfectly. The uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque has been rebuilt six times due to to earthquake damage, so it doesn't fit precisely right. But the Alcaz Fountain, all this is right on the right on that center line. The equestrian statue of Hadrian, that presumably was over the Holy of Holies, is right over the Al where the Alcaz Fountain is. And so that's kind of exciting. And so there are three conjectures. The southern conjecture, the traditional view, and the northern conjecture. We won't know which one's correct until we really get uh, opportunity to do serious archaeology which is uh, what's going on right now is the Muslims are trying to destroy every evidence of the Hebrew history on the Temple Mount because it's under uh, Muslim control at the moment. Infrared photography of the Dome of the Rock reveals something very strange. There's a pentagonal th structure underneath that. It is conjectured by some expert that that's the foundations of the Strabo Tower. There's a Strabo Tower in uh, Caesarea. If this is what we think it is, then it, it, it confirms the view that the Dome of the Rock is actually standing where the Antonia Fortress was back in those days. This is all very controversial, of course. If we look at infrared photography of the Jerusalem itself, here's a sketch to line you up here. There's where the Dome of the Rock is. You can just, th th these, this is a montage of infrared photography, which records the heat transmission, which reveals what's underneath. But there's where the Dome of the Rock would be. There is, a temp there is the wall. It's interesting that behind this Turkish wall, there's a lot of activity down here at the southern end, which would confirm that uh, view of, of the, uh, the temple. Not conclusive, just suggestive, but it does tend to reinforce the southern conjecture. It turns out the bedrock drops fast enough that one, one proposal, I don't think it'll be taken seriously, and yet it's provocative, if, is if you could build the temple today without touching the temple mount by building it underneath it, because the bedrock drops far enough that you could put it where it originally stood without even, by going in behind the Russian wall. 
Uh, will that happen? I don't think so, but it's a provocative thing. We'll just have to wait and see. We have all this summarized in a briefing package called the Coming Temple Update. Mount Sinai is it in Arabia. This is a satellite picture of the Sinai Peninsula, as it's called, the Mediterranean Sea near the top, the Gulf of Suez to the left, Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea. Jerusalem is up here, the upper right, and the Dead Sea. Mount Sinai, the traditional site, is about here. And Midian, uh, over here, is, is Arabia, and this is the northwest corner of Arabia. Bob Cornuk is one of those that has investigated this, and it's interesting, by using the Bible and following what it says, he's convinced, and many others are, that it's the, the real Mount Sinai is Jabal al-Laws. In fact, they've discovered an underwater a land bridge across the Gulf of Aqaba. There's a whole story about that that uh, we don't have time to go into here, but I want to let you that Bob Cornuke, he has published a book on the discoveries. This is a picture of Jabal al-Laws. See that mountain? It looks like it's in the shadow. Clear sky. No, there are no clouds there. That mountain is blackened because it's been melted. When you take one of the rocks and break it open, it's granite. It's not, it's not volcanic. It's the, it, that heat has been ex applied from the outside. They found the 12 pillars. They found the uh, altar of the uh, golden calf. There's a whole exciting story that we'll leave for a separate occasion. Noah's Ark, another issue. Where, is it in Turkey or Iran? We know from Genesis 11, two, uh, 1 and 2, that all the world spoke after the flood one language. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain and the plain, a land of Shinar, where they, and they dwelt there. Well, the land of Shinar, which is Babylon and all that, is right here. If they came from the east, that means Ararat and all of that had to be east. That's Iran, not Iraq. Well, wait a minute, where is Mount Ararat? Mount Ararat in Turkey, the traditional site, is up here north of Shinar. Using the Bible, you can convince yourself that the real Mount Ararat is somewhere east, and Bob thinks he's found it. There's no evidence of it yet. That's one of his ambitions, is to uh, try to confirm that uh, view. And from what we know from the scripture, it would not, uh, we don't know yet, but it would not surprise me. All, all the legends and stories about Mount Ararat don't quite compute, by the way. So that's what makes that exciting. And then there's this issue of the Ark of the Covenant. Everyone wants to know where is the Ark, and does it have a prophetic role? That's another topic. The, the, the uh, Noah's Ark story and the Ark of the Covenant story are stories that we'll reserve for another time simply because there are some very exciting things going on over the next number of months that may alter our entire view of both the Noah's Ark and also the Ark of the Covenant. Before we get, leave this topic, though, I want to talk about the dark side of archaeology. All through history, there have been the Holy Grail legends. And much, uh, much, many stories about that. There's people who claim they've got splinters from Noah's Ark. There's people that are interested in the Shroud of Turin. How many have heard of the Shroud of Turin here? Okay. Now, by the way, there are many experts to this day that believe the Shroud of Turin is authentic. That's not the issue. I want to remind you back in Numbers 21, where Moses was told uh, they had fiery serpents that were attacking the people. Moses prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told Moses to put a brass serpent on a pole. Everyone that looked to that pole would be healed. And that's kind of a weird solution for the thing, isn't it? Well, the brazen serpent, Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. You may wonder, why did what a strange way for God to heal the people he wanted to heal from those, those dangerous serpents. We understand that better when we get to John chapter 3, because Jesus himself makes reference to the fact that that was a prophetic application to himself. As Moses raised the serpent, the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. Now, there are many references of the Christ that are idiomatic. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10.4, says the rock that fell in the wilderness was Christ. And you may recall, the first time they encountered they needed water. God, uh, God told Moses to strike the rock with his staff. That's in Exodus 17, and he did, and the water came forth and took care of them. By the way, that spot Looks like they found it there at Jabal al laws incidentally. It's quite a dramatic uh, situation. The second time, it occurs the second time in Numbers 20. And again, they're out of water. They've been wandering now, and, and, and uh, they're out of water. Moses goes to God, and God says, speak to the rock and give them water. Well, Moses is really upset with the people. He's angry, and he strikes the rock again. That's not what God told him to do. He told him to speak to the rock, and the water will come. Moses strikes the rock, and water comes. But God says, Moses... 
it's over. And Moses spent 40 years in Egypt before he left. He went spent 40 years on the backside of the desert with Yvonne de Carlo. That goes by. You don't remember the Ten Commandments, Yvonne de Carlo? I'm sorry. I, I'm getting blank stares. That didn't fly. Okay. Anyway, he spent 40 years in the backside of the desert with uh, 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 married to one of Jethro's daughters. And then he spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. 120 years he's committed to ruling these unruly really people. And because he didn't do it right here, God says, you're not going to enter the promised land. Heavy trip. He misrepresented God to the people. But something very provocative, if he had done what God asked him to do, it would have modeled the first and second comings. Christ is smitten once and only once. He was that rock, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians. See, prophecy is pattern, not just prediction. Very profound point. Genesis 22, Abram's offering of Isaac. Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. There's a whole study there. Hosea 11.1, 1, Matthew points out. That when Joseph and Mary and the baby come out of Egypt, it's fulfilling prophecy. Out of Egypt I've called my son. You go to Hosea 11.1, there's no way you can bend that around to being messianic. But it was a pattern. So this is the Midrashic uh, school of interpretation of prophecy, which is something we need to study. But the reason I'm getting into this, in 2 Kings 18, King Hezekiah. This is centuries after Moses, many centuries. He's discovering that the people are still worshiping this brazen serpent. That brazen serpent is still around, and it's the authentic brazen serpent. There's no, apparently no question about it being real. It is the brazen serpent that Moses had back there in Numbers 21. They're worshiping it, and Hezekiah destroys it and calls it Nehustan, meaning a thing of brass. And there's a lesson here. There's a lesson here. On the one hand, we get excited about these discoveries. There's a danger that we take them too seriously. The Shroud of Turin is more dangerous if it's authentic than if it's a fraud because we tend to make fetishes of them. Now, by the way, the brazen serpent, I have to mention this, that the, 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 this whole business of the healing serpent, the day of Moses, gave rise to a Greek legend called Aesculapius, the, the god of healing. And it's interesting how most of you may have seen the, the serpents on a pole as a symbol of medicine. See, whoever did that didn't do their homework. Because Aesculapius is a single serpent on a pole. Many nurse groups have that as a sign. But when you see a doctor and he has the two serpents, that's called the Caduceus. That's actually the symbol of Hermes, the god of commerce. I just thought I'd point that out. Okay. Okay. So that concludes a quick survey of archaeology.